Thank you, Jill, and thank you to the Society. This is a, a, a very nice honor. Um, one of the best parts of this is that you get to uh, choose your uh, co-speakers. And uh, so the overall uh, symposium has this title. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to be emphasizing uh, running, distance running, biological springs, my second speaker in our symposium, Allison, will be talking about running sprinting with augmented leg springs. That's the yellow in case you missed the theme there. And uh, Alina is going to be talking about running sprinting and jumping on prosthetic leg springs. Okay. Um, before I go any further, I do want to assure people here at the Mayo Clinic that my decision to not wear a necktie is evidence-based. Uh, this... <laughs> 2018 paper caught my attention and uh, had to include that. Uh, neck, neckties reduce blood flow by seven and a half, uh, cerebral blood flow by seven and a half percent, and I need as much cerebral blood flow as I can get. Uh, disclosure of interest, uh, uh, conflict of interest is that I am a paid consultant to Nike. My lab has conducted research under contract from Nike. Okay, uh, as a, a physiologist, uh, I, I understand that uh, distance running performance is determined basically by three properties. The aerobic capacity of an individual, the anaerobic capacity of an individual, and their metabolic cost to run at a certain speed. Uh, your aerobic capacity and your anaerobic capacity have nothing to do with biomechanics. So uh, I'm going to focus on the submaximal. Is some people call it efficiency. We, we, I tend to call it running economy. Um, and we're, this, is a, this slide is an overall outline of what I'm going to uh, present to you today. So we're going to talk about how the biomechanics of springs uh, determine or save metabolic energy, and then talk about how metabolic cost uh, directly affects running performance. And I'm going to start out on the left and move my way to the right. Uh, I like history, and I like the history of our field. I want to uh, go back and look a little bit of, at least about uh, how the idea that springs are used in running uh, developed. It goes back to at least 1895. This is one of my, uh, and also Roger Anoka's scientific heroes, uh, Etienne Jules Marais, um, who did a lot of amazing things. Also, Peter Cavanaugh, one of my mentors, uh, turned me on to, uh, to this guy. Uh, Marais said that uh, elastic tissues, not specified which, uh, uh, whether he was talking about tendons or muscles, but he did recognize that uh, there were elastic tissues. Uh, in 1895, there was still something called vitalism. This was a very vague concept. It, it, it may be familiar in the 21st century to people who are sort of new agey and so on. It, it's, it's never really, it was not a scientific thing. It's one of the rare things that Moray was not scientific about, but uh, clearly had some uh, inklings of the idea of elastic uh, properties uh, affecting running. Um, Wallace Fenn was an early pioneer, an American. He used a mechanical force platform, mechanical in that there was no electricity or electronics. It, it moved a lever on a rotating drum and recorded forces. He's probably the first to <clears throat> make reasonable measurements of the mechanical energy and uh, fluctuations in running. He didn't study distance running, unfortunately. Um, and I love the, this is a direct quote, in short, many facts fit beautifully into the theory that an isometrically contracting muscle possesses mechanical potential energy like a stretch spring and does work by this means. Um, uh, I wish I could write such a nice sentence in my paper today, and it, it, still, would be, it still would be true. Um, Giovanni Cavagna uh, made the move to an elect, uh, early electronic force platform and could record the center of mass, the energy fluctuations of the center of mass, the vertical. Uh, gravitational potential energy and the kinetic energy fluctuations uh, while the foot's on the ground and decelerating and accelerating. Um, uh, Cavagna was also a muscle, is also a muscle physiologist, and uh, at early in '63 and and still some in 1977, uh, it was still there that running is an exchange between mechanical energy stored in muscles, elastic elements, as opposed to tendons elements. Uh, and recovered both uh, kinetic and gravitational energy as in a bouncing ball. Uh, so I visited Cavagna once, and he had this uh, cartoon on his uh, 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 office wall of a child, and uh, it said, uh, 
had a car like uh, stopping in the it was a warning sign or something like beware of children and it was uh, uh, beware of the bouncing ball there's usually a bouncing child behind it and uh, okay uh, this was a seminal paper in my career I became aware of it when I was at Penn State under Peter Kavanaugh um, paper by uh, Terry Dawson and and eventually my doctoral mentor uh, uh, Richard Taylor Dick Taylor um, <coughs> These guys were not biomechanists at the, at the time. They wanted to understand heat load in kangaroos and how it was uh, dissipated. It's a desert animal, and uh, it, it does exercise and, and hop around. And to their surprise, uh, they found that when they increased the speed of the treadmill, the kangaroo didn't use energy at a faster rate, but in fact used energy at the same rate. Or the Dawson and Taylor's actually the dashed line over there. Oops. That advances. Middle button for laser. Um, oh, jeez. Uh, Dawson and Taylor's the dashed line. That's for uh, n equals 2. And then uh, in 1998, I replicated those measurements on another n equals 2. So a total of four kangaroos have been studied, to my knowledge. <laughs> but the pattern is very consistent and, and really pretty amazing. Uh, the next year, uh, Neil Alexander. Uh, came and visited uh, Dick Taylor's lab at Harvard and uh, did a mechanical analysis and started the move towards recognizing that this energy storage is probably taking place in the tendons. Uh, Alexander was both a, a fine anatomist as well as a biomechanist, and uh, uh, I think he got us headed in the right direction on this. Um, another of my doctoral mentors, you know, these kind of talks, you get to tip your hat to the people who got you where you were where you are. And uh, Tom McMahon was my, another of my doctoral mentors and developed the spring mass model. And uh, many, you've probably seen numerous presentations uh, over the conference using the, the simple spring mass model. Uh, and it is amazing how well it works for how simple it is in describing and characterizing uh, how our legs behave when we run. OK. That's a history lesson. <coughs> um, if we try to think about what the possible benefits of springs are for running, it's not as clear as, uh, as you might think. So obviously, tendons can act as springs and store and return elastic energy. And that is probably a very useful function. <clears throat> and by doing so, tendons, uh, the tendons acting like springs can reduce the excursion of the muscle fibers. In other words, reduce the amount of work that the uh, muscle fibers have to do. And until recently, we always thought that was going to be the cheapest way to, to operate muscles was isometrically. Um, there's another anatomical and somewhat indirect that's not as obvious but is getting more attention, uh, certainly emphasized by Tom Roberts, that uh, tendons allow for short muscle fibers. So it, it, it may be that they're just a, a cheap way to connect uh, the muscle uh, to the bone and that by having short muscle fibers, you have to activate less volume but since force is determined by cross-sectional area, you can have short fibers in, in the same cross-sectional area, but less volume. And that's a potential way that springs, tendons, uh, tendons acting like springs can save energy in, in locomotion. So um, this, is, uh, this slide has some assumptions of perfection. And we're, none of us are perfect. But let's go with it for an intellectual argument. If tendons are perfect springs, then muscles can generate force isometrically and perform zero work. Okay? Um, if that's the case, then the metabolic cost should be proportional to the muscle force rather than the work that we observe from the outside. Okay? So that's probably the best idea I've had in my career. All right? <clears throat> and, we, and we followed it up with a paper uh, for my dissertation where we uh, had, it, it's a simple idea. We call it the cost of generating force hypothesis. And that is that when you run, the main thing you have to do is support the weight of your body against gravity. And that, that doesn't vary. Your weight stays the same. But what does vary is the rate at which you have to generate that force on the ground. When we run faster, the time available to generate force on the ground decreases. We call that contact time. And we made a, a, a we, we knew that the uh, force was going to be the, the metabolic. We proposed that the metabolic rate would be proportional to the average vertical force and the rate of generating that force. And we wanted an external indicator of uh, or proxy for what that rate of generating force, the rate of the cross bridges cycling in the muscle would be. And, and we came up with contact time. So 
if the metabolic rate, if the meta, thank you. If the metabolic rate is proportional to the weight of the body and also inversely proportional to the time of contact, we can rearrange that to an equation where we have uh, body weight on the left side, the, the mass-specific metabolic rate, and it's proportional. It, it's equal to a constant, which we called the cost coefficient because we didn't think it was going to be perfectly constant, um, times 1 over Tc. We tested this in a variety of species over a wide range of speed. We've had some quadrupeds. We have some bipedal hopping animals, and as you can see, we've got, we have data from like 0.7 meters a second to 7 meters a second, so pretty wide diversity. <clears throat> the rate of energy consumption sorry, in all these animals increases linearly across the gait from a trot to a gallop, for example, in the dogs and the horses. Across this same speed range, one over the contact time, which we call the rate of generating force, also increases linearly. So this was one of the highlights of making this graph, seeing the data come out, was one of the highlights of my doctoral degree. It's like, hey, maybe there's a connection. <clears throat> and in fact, if we plot that cost coefficient across speed in these uh, five different species, we see that it's pretty darn similar across a wide range and also pretty constant across speed. So we thought we were on to something. Uh, Shortly thereafter, my uh, graduate uh, student colleague, uh, Tom Roberts, backed us up. So we assumed that the force generated was isometric, and we didn't know that. We just hoped for that. But Tom uh, uh, very meticulously put on uh, sonomicrometers and measured the, uh, the velocity of sound in muscles you know, in, in real time so that he could estimate the, uh, he could measure, not just estimate, the length changes in the, in the muscle. And he had stra glued strain gauges onto the uh, uh, calcified tendon so he could measure the force simultaneously. And basically what Tom found was for level running turkeys on, uh, uh, in the gastrocnemius muscle, the muscle fibers undergo very little length change. The, the assumption of is isometric muscle action was pretty good. The next year, Tom combined uh, some of data that I collected with some of his data. And we uh, extended the cost of generating force hypothesis to bipeds, a variety of crazy birds that we had at the Concord Field Station, as well as the species of interest to this conference mostly is humans. So metabolic rate increases pretty close to linearly in humans. The rate of generating force increases pretty uh, linearly in humans. And the cost coefficient in humans stays uh, relatively constant across a doubling in speed uh, from 2 meters a second, pretty slow running, to 4 meters a second. <clears throat> we calculated that in human runners, that just this uh, one factor, really, contact time, could account for about 70% of the increase in metabolic rate from 2 to 4 meters a second. And, and, and you know, that's not bad. 70% is a C. Okay. Um, but we wanted to go further, and, and, and when I started my PhD, uh, we, I, I did postdoc on some unfairly uh, a different topic, uh, insect locomotion. And I came back to humans for, uh, when I became an assistant professor, and I wanted to unravel that. I was curious about, well, it can't be just vertical force. There's a lot of other things that our muscles do when we run. So I developed a strategy and have had a, a series of uh, fantastic graduate students over probably a fifth, well, I've had them over my whole career, but over about a 15 year period where they helped to uh, attack this problem. And our strategy uh, was to measure the energy cost of normal running at one speed, to invent some sort of a simple device that was cheap. That's a key thread throughout my career is the cheap part. Um, <clears throat> uh, invent a device to assist with one of, the, one of those running tasks, and then measure the decrease in the energy cost when we used springs, uh, external springs to do that, and then infer that the decrease in metabolic cost reflects what the actual cost of doing that is with muscles. So <clears throat> this has a lot of springs in it, and uh, we, did, we developed these different crazy devices one at a time, and then I had a master's student, Aaron Wardrop, who combined them all, and, and then Chris Ariano helped me to uh, synthesize this uh, information. So on the, uh, imagine the, the left, 
figure without everything on at once. Initially, we started with the person running and just the BWS, the body weight support uh, system, pulling up on the person. And then the data over on the right are normalized. So metabolic rate is, uh, is at 100%. This is normal running. And then as we pulled up and pulled up and pulled up, the cost of running decreased. And if we extrapolate that to, uh, to zero weight, uh, we found that we could calculate it was about a 65, it would have been a 65% reduction in the metabolic cost of running. So body weight is not the, everything, about 65%. Not bad, kind of like the seven, reminiscent of the 70% we talked about. So then we pulled up and we pulled forward. That's the body weight support plus the uh, aiding horizontal force. <clears throat> and when we combine those, darn, should have used my slide advancer. Oh, well. Uh, okay. When we combine those, body weight support and uh, aiding horizontal force, we, get a, uh, we can extrapolate to about 80% of the cost of running is just those two factors, body weight support and fore aft uh, breaking in propulsion. Okay. Then we added in this uh, leg swing assist device. And again, we got a further reduction in the metabolic cost of running. And if we extrapolate that to, to zero weight, we can account for about 87% of the cost, uh, cost of running at three meters per second. And again, in academic terms, an 87 is pretty good, right? That's a B plus. But it's at one speed. And at, uh, so uh, at, we wanted to know some of it. We wanted to see if we could fill in the 87 even further. Chris Ariano uh, was my graduate student and is now at the University of Houston assistant professor. Uh, Chris and I did experiments where we uh, measured the metabolic cost of lateral balance in running. And we also uh, did some studies on arm swing. Arm swing actually doesn't have a cost. It has a, a savings. So we couldn't figure out really how to put that into this pie chart. Um, and then we, with the help of my colleague, Bill Burns, we estimated the cost of just breathing comprises about 4% of the cost of running itself. So now we're up to 93%. That's an A minus. And uh, we're pretty happy. But there's still something bugging me. Right? So, so this was 2014. And, and uh, I, had, uh, I, I still had uh, fantastic graduate students. But I had just the right graduate student to go back to this problem of <clears throat> that we could only account for 70% of the increase at faster running speeds. So don't confuse this 70% with the 93%. This is 70% of the cost running it uh, uh, across is the increase in speed. Okay. So in that paper with Tom uh, Roberts back in 1998, we speculated that the reason why it wasn't a perfect match might have something to do with mechanical advantage that a poor mechanical advantage would result in an increase in active muscle volume as, at faster speeds, and that uh, that, may, that factor might uh, explain the remaining 30% uh, of the increase uh, across speed. So uh, mechanical advantage is uh, very familiar to this audience, but just briefly we express it as the ratio of the uh, moment arm of the muscle force uh, divided by the moment arm of the ground reaction force. And uh, we proposed, basic, we, we thought that basically the leg was becoming more bent as we ran faster. So if at slow speeds you're running with a more upright limb posture, and at faster speeds, higher forces, and your leg is compressing more, that means that your muscles are going to be operating at a, a slightly uh, uh, worse mechanical advantage. Um, you can just download the paper later. It's, it's, up, it's up now. Um, and that's going to uh, decrease, uh, that's going to increase the muscle volume required to run to support the same weight. So uh, that was the idea that we proposed back in 1998. As I said, uh, somewhere around 2014, I, uh, Shalea Kipp joined our lab. And over time for her master's thesis, in addition to the other 10 papers she's published as a master's student, uh, she did this as her thesis. And, uh, and, and we, what, what we really like about it is that instead of breaking things down into vertical and horizontal, which the muscles have no idea, the muscles don't know whether they're generating a force to lift the body and propel the body up or to propel the body forward, uh, 
Muscles just know that they're generating force when the force foot's on the ground. Um, so we just calculated, we just, Shalea just calculated, did all the difficult experiments of uh, inverse dynamics and calculated the volume of active muscle uh, over a range of speeds. So we've now switched from uh, C, the cost coefficient, to K, uh, uh, because this equation is, uh, is, is really fundamentally different in that we're not assuming that the only force being generated is body weight. And we chose K because Kip and Crump. <laughs> <coughs> so uh, Shalaik recruited 10 very high caliber runners. Uh, we, the, you could do the study in Boulder and not a lot of other places. These folks had a VO2 max of 74 at altitude. They could run uh, up to 18 kilometers an hour. That's uh, 520 mile pace at a, a submaximally. They were not uh, you know, exhausted. They were below lactate threshold at 18 kilometers an hour, if that means anything to you. We collaborated with uh, uh, Alina Grabowski's lab because she has a really nice motion capture system and, and uh, uh, forced treadmill. And uh, we did a, the, the full nine yards. I don't want to go too much in detail because Shalea this afternoon is going to get to present her own work, and I can just take credit for it now. <laughs> uh, we relied on the uh, anatomical data from uh, Andy B. Winner's uh, paper that also relied on data for that Tom Roberts actually collected on uh, cadavers. Uh, to And those were older cadavers, which is a weakness potential weakness, but the main thing we needed was uh, fascicle length, which does not, uh, to my knowledge, change with age. So we know muscle volume changes, but we calculated muscle volume based on inverse dynamics. Okay, what did we find? What did Shalea find? She found that, no surprise, metabolic rate increases uh, with running speed. If you look at it over a long enough, a wide enough speed range, you start to notice that metabolic rate increases curvilinearly rather than linearly. So we see that pretty, pretty uh, clearly when you go up to 18 kilometers an hour. She found that the, what we call the rate of generating force, one over contact time, increased at faster running speeds as we surely expected. This was the, the hardest part of her study, was calculating the total active muscle volume in the extensors during the stance phase. And she broke it down by uh, joint by joint, and she... Uh, found that the active muscle volume increased by about 54% over this speed range. Okay? Um, the number's kind of interesting. It does have an assumption of uh, isometric force, but if you can think about a two-liter Pepsi bottle, uh, each leg is uh, activating more or less a two-liter Pepsi bottle of muscle uh, when you're running at a, at a, a distance running speed. So I, I never really thought about how much... Uh, we have a lot of extra muscle. Well, some of us do. <laughs> um, to go back to the, the main focus here, the, the, the hypothesis was that the cost coefficient, if this, if this idea holds, the cost coefficient should be, the new cost coefficient should be uh, constant across speed. And indeed, that's what we found, not significantly different, no trend, uh, no, no real pattern. Um, this is uh, fantastic from my point of view. Another way to express it is to plot the actual metabolic rate to take that uh, average K from the previous slide and calculate what you would predict. And if you do this incredibly optimistic comparison, you find that we can account for 98% of the increase in metabolic rate. Okay? I never got a 98 in any class I ever took. All right, so again, to plug uh, Shalea's uh, presentation this afternoon at, uh, in, in the ra running rapid, not the rapid running podium session, uh, in suite 106. Okay, I talked about uh, the uh, possible benefits of spring from a muscle perspective. Uh, uh, these are three of the ways that that can work. They involve some, assum some assumptions. Uh, there have been other studies that challenge some of these ideas uh, <clears throat> to some extent. Glenn Lickwork has, has measured using... Uh, uh, ultrasound, how the muscle fibers change in running humans. It looks like uh, in the diagram, wow, look at the muscles are shortening a lot, but if you calculate the velocity of shortening, they're only shortening at about 5% of the maximum shortening velocity, so pretty close to isometric from an energetic point of view. Um, uh, Natalie Holt, who's at Northern Arizona University, not my graduate student, um, did a very nice study on isolated frog muscle using uh, techniques that A.V. Hill would be proud know are still being used uh, 
and, and found a very puzzling, uh, not puzzling, but, but uh, groundbreaking, whatever you want to call it. it. It really has a lot of muscle physiologists shaking their head, but she performed work loop experiments for comparing the energetic cost from heat measurements for isometric muscle, from stretch shortened work loops, and from uh, uh, just shortened work loops with passive lengthening. And uh, the metabolic cost of unit, generating a unit of force is not significantly different between a stretch shortened or an isometric. So we assumed isometric in all this analysis I've talked about, but even if we're wrong, even if it is some stretch shortened, it still may be uh, that this, may, this work may, this research may indicate that that's why. Okay, it's the Hay Symposium. I've talked about how biomechanics affect the metabolic cost of running, but the purpose of the Hay, the, the mission statement of the Hay Memorial Lecture, it should uh, highlight how the biomechanical principles directly impact performance of sport. So that's what I'm going to do in the last part here. <clears throat> if we uh, can somehow reduce the rate of metabolic energy consumption at a specific velocity, it would enable an individual to run faster at the same effort. Uh, Walter Hochhammer and Shalea and I are working on a paper to calculate this. It's not uh, immediately obvious, but because the rate of energy consumption or oxygen consumption increases curvilinearly, if you're slow, <coughs> like me now, and you decrease your, you have some way of decreasing your oxygen consumption at a certain speed by a lot, by 10%, that's going to give you a 12.6% boost in velocity. But if you're really fast and you decrease by 10%, it's only going to give you a 6.7% increase in velocity. So it's, it's a little bit of diminishing returns. It's not easy to reduce somebody's, the rate of somebody's uh, metabolic energy consumption. But it is really easy to increase the rate of metabolic energy consumption at specific velocity. And so if you do that, you would predict that people will run slower. And we did that by making heavy shoes. Well, we didn't make them. Nike provided us with shoes that had uh, BBs in them, little lead BBs, very sneakily placed in the shoes. They had 100 grams in, uh, per shoe in one pair <coughs> and 300 added grams in another pair. These shoes were identical. Uh, we could tell the difference, but the subjects could not tell the difference. Uh, we had 18 subjects. Only one person figured it out during the study, and that was because they have a very wide foot, and uh, they couldn't, they, we didn't, we should have put longer laces in the 300 gram added shoe because it was a little bit bulkier. Anyhow, we had 18 runners who, who were good. Uh, they could run under 20 minutes for 5K. They weren't as good as the other uh, study I told you about, but. Uh, uh, we had them run 3,000-meter time trials on an indoor track one week apart. We told them we were doing a repeatability study, and they bought it. <laughs> <laughs> the reason they bought it is because Shalea was a psychology double major as an undergrad, and uh, so we, we took a, a, a little styrofoam or a balsa wood thing, and we said, oh, this is a very expensive accelerometer, and we're going to place it on your foot and tape it in place, and we don't want you to handle it or touch it. And then we helped them on with their shoe and tied their shoe for them. They never held the shoe in their hand. They didn't know that they were wearing heavy shoes. You can imagine if we didn't, if we said, all right, we want you to run as fast as you can. Today you're going to have these lead bricks. Everybody, <laughs> everybody would run faster. But this deception uh, worked perfectly. So she seems innocent, but she's very sneaky. <laughs> all right, what did we find? And, and Ray Browning has made fun of me for this. Uh, in really important discovery, I found that if you wear heavy shoes, you run slower. But we, quant <laughs> we quantified that when you add 100 grams to each shoe, and you, uh, the average person slowed down by 4 seconds. And when we add 300 grams, they slowed down by 15 seconds. So that, uh, that slope is about 0.7. It is 0.78% uh, slowing for every 100 grams that we added. We then brought people back in the lab. We told them uh, what we were doing. We, had, we measured their oxygen consumption wearing uh, the heavy shoes. And we found that metabolic rate increased by 1.1% per 100 grams. Not exactly disappointing, but a little bit puzzling. We decided that's at 3.5 meters a second, which is what this, these guys could sustain. But we went back to the literature. Uh, Ned Frederick in 1984 had much higher caliber runners and had them run it as fast as 4.88 meters a second and found that there was actually a diminishing return that at, at that speed, 
it, uh, adding 100 grams only increased the metabolic cost by 0.81%. And if you are had a cup of coffee this morning, you might remember that 0.81 is really close to 0.78. So we had a, a very nice, almost direct relationship between increased cost of metabolic, uh, metabolic cost of running and slowing of performance. So we make the, the leap of if we could reduce the energetic cost of running, we would enhance performance. But uh, this is a study done uh, by Vauther and Shalea, and uh, their attention to detail and their meticulousness was the only thing that would make this possible. That you could detect a four-second uh, worsening in performance statistically uh, requires that you control diet, exercise, sleep, as much as we could possibly control. And you have to lie to people. Um, <clears throat> so the, the theme of today was to take uh, update you as to how we think biomechanics determines the metabolic cost of running and to share with you how that, uh, in the spirit of the, of the uh, sports biomechanics and Jim Hay, how that uh, biomechanics with one step in the middle is affecting athletic performance. Um, the symposium is going to have two more speakers. And I've talked about biological springs, emphasizing the top three here, advantages of uh, or be possible benefits of springs. We're going to hear about how inter uh, so I'm, I talked about internal springs, tendons. And they're going to talk about how external springs uh, can do things like reduce impact and reduce the muscular effort for cushioning. Uh, parallel springs, exoskeletons that can reduce muscle force, and series springs such as shoe midsoles and uh, running blades, press, running specific prostheses that um, uh, can replace the, when you don't have muscles, you can still have springs. Um, I, this is, I, I do like history. Uh, this was, uh, uh, Shalaya's paper was accepted on July 16th this summer, 2018. And if you look carefully, uh, our paper on bipeds was, pub was accepted July 14th in 1998. So 20 years and two days. Uh, and so uh, in the spirit of, is Paul DeVita here today? Uh, in, the, in the spirit of uh, flippancy of Paul DeVita, I uh, put <coughs> Sergeant Pepper. Uh, it was 20 years ago today. Sergeant Pepper taught the band to play. This is a little bit of a theme from my lab. Uh, they've been going in and out of style, but they're guaranteed to raise a smile. Uh, it's been wonderful to be here. It's certainly a thrill. Uh, you've been, uh, I, uh, you're such a lovely audience. We'd like to take you home with us. We'd love to take you home. All All right, good morning, and I'm really happy to share some research that Roger's been a part of in a lot of ways as part of the Hay Symposium. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit, but also be talking about kind of assistive devices. I'm going to talk about running specific prostheses and their effects on performance both during running, sprinting, and then also jumping. So Roger explained uh, the biomechanical determinants of running economy very well. Uh, he talked about some uh, initial work um, by Crom and Taylor in 1990 that tried to explain metabolic cost in terms of the contact time on the ground. And um, I won't go into detail about that because he already explained it. Um, I think we've added a lot by creating a new equation to try to understand what determines uh, metabolic economy in running by looking at active muscle volume. And he also explained that these Biomechanical variables explain about 98% of the increase in metabolic rate required to run at faster velocities. So I'm going to take this uh, information and try to tra translate it to people with amputations running with running specific prostheses and see if there are differences or similarities between the two. In addition to economy, I also want to understand what drives speed. So we're going to talk about specific biomechanical variables that influence speed. For many in the audience, this will bore you for a second. Okay? But velocity is stride frequency times stride length. A stride is an event in one foot to the same event in the same foot. And in that stride, a person exerts force on the ground. So what you can see on this bottom graph is force in terms of newtons across time 
and they have this sort of characteristic pattern that they use to run. They have a contact time, an aerial time, another contact time, another aerial time, and then that comprises a stride. It's important to define these things to try to understand, again, how this might compare in a non-amputee compared to an athlete with an amputation. And we can rearrange the velocity equation to get velocity in terms of force. So if we look at that, now velocity is step frequency times the stance average vertical ground reaction force, the force exerted just during that contact time, times the contact length, or how far forward the person moves during the contact time. Again, just sort of basic principles of how we move, but these are really important when we start trying to compare different types of legs. And so that's what we try to do. Um, I study a lot of people that have leg amputations that use running specific prostheses. So these can either be C-shaped, like the image on the left, and fit beneath the socket in the residual limb, or J-shaped, like the image on the right, and those sort of stick onto the back of the socket. These devices are passive. They can store and return energy, but they can't generate energy on their own. The athlete has to generate the energy to get these things to move. It's a really important distinction. And there's a lot of misperceptions, I think, about what these prostheses can and can't do. In any case, uh, these are basically springs that act in series with the leg. So as um, the other two speakers have already talked about, these are springs, so we want to understand how they affect performance. All of the research that I've done on running specific prostheses really started with this guy. So this is Oscar Pistorius. He has bilateral transtibial amputations. Um, we kind of had to come into his first controversy and not the second unfortunate controversy. <laughs> I don't like to talk about that, but we always have to say that. Uh, we wanted to understand how his prostheses affected performance. There was a lot of controversy because he wanted to compete in the Olympics. And the governing body of track and field, the IAAF, made a rule suggesting that he couldn't compete because of the use of these springs. We did a bunch of studies on Oscar to try to understand how these prostheses affect performance. And we found that basically his aerobic metabolism or economy and his rate of fatigue were not different from non, were not different compared to non-amputees, but his biomechanics were very different compared to non-amputees. So he had lower stance average vertical ground reaction forces and peak vertical ground reaction forces, longer contact times, shorter swing times, and faster step frequencies. Now, a lot of these could be due to the lightweight nature of prostheses, and they are also due to the fact that these prostheses are passive. We presented our, uh, um, all of our research to the Court of Arbitration in Sport. We supported his appeal to compete in the Olympics, and he did in 2012. Okay. So this was exciting, but it still kind of drove me to try to understand, well, how do prostheses affect performance? Maybe we need to do a bunch more studies to try to figure this out. So we wanted to look at a range of different athletes and really get at whether economy or aerobic metabolism differed across athletes. So we asked that question directly. Does economy differ? We looked at all these different studies. And if we use Roger's uh, equations, Shalea's equations, we see that the contact time is equal across athletes, about the same if we look at a whole huge range of athletes. But actually, the active muscle volume is a lot less in athletes with an amputation compared to non-amputees. We can calculate things like the effective moment arm and really kind of get a good prediction of active muscle volume. But for athletes with a unilateral amputation, it would predict that economy would be 15% lower, better. And for athletes with bilateral amputations, it would be 30% lower or better. The cost of leg swing could also influence economy. It could be a little bit lower for athletes with an amputation compared to non-amputees. But there's also a host of other issues when you have an amputation. So you can have what's called socket pistoning. You lose a lot of energy because the residual limb kind of moves up and down in that socket. And especially um, if you're running at a good clip, uh, that could be excessive. Nonetheless, we sort of predicted that uh, amputees should have a much lower economy than non-amputees. But when we look across a wide range of studies, this is uh, athletes with a unilateral amputation and their gross cost of transport or the amount of energy to run a given distance. We've got an average 
a high and a low range of economy just to give you scale and try to see if this matches or doesn't match with non-amputees. Here's our athletes with bilateral transtibial amputations. Here's a group of non-amputees, both club and elite runners. And what you can see is on average, there's not much of a difference. And amputees are definitely not more economical than non-amputees. So our predictions are wrong. The biomechanics that affect economy in amputees are likely different than the biomechanics that affect economy in non-amputees. If we do a direct comparison of the averages, actually for a unilateral amputee, with all of the published literature that's out there, their economy is about 13% greater than that of non-amputees, so worse. And for bilateral amputees, it's not significantly different. And it's also important to notice that the range of all these different economy values, lows and highs, fit within the range of all non-amputee values. This is a tricky comparison to make because there are many, many, many values of economy that are out in the literature. So we could kind of pick and choose non-amputees. But we have the most economical person on record down here and probably some of the higher economies up here. And again, amputees seem to fit within the range of non-amputees. So again, this suggests that economy is not different despite very different biomechanics. Okay, so that's for running economy. Oscar sort of drove that, but he also drove um, an interest for me in trying to understand what affects top speed and what, effect, what biomechanical factors affect top speed. So we did a study back in about 2010 where we looked at uh, athletes with a unilateral transtibial amputation across a range of speeds and we measured their biomechanics from a slow speed on up to their fastest top speed. Now these athletes are ideal because you can measure force in each individual leg. So you can compare the unaffected leg to the affected leg in the same athlete and figure out what's going on with running specific prostheses. I'm going to uh, just get out of this for a second and then show you the video. We're having a little trouble with the video this morning. So this is our fastest athlete, uh, female athlete with a unilateral amputation. Craig McGowan in the background. And this is our fastest athlete with a male athlete with an amputation. Okay. So um, despite the cheering, you can kind of see that these athletes are very smooth and very talented runners. And what's kind of cool and interesting is that actually between their legs, they have very different biomechanics. So in the affected leg, their stance average vertical ground reaction force is 9% lower than the unaffected leg across a wide range of speeds. If we look at another important variable, step frequency, this was sort of a surprise. At the fastest top speed, we'd expect step frequency in the affected leg, the lightweight prosthesis leg, to be a lot faster. Actually, it was the unaffected leg that had a faster step frequency at the fastest top speed. So it seems like because the prosthesis limits force, the unaffected leg is doing things to compensate and still allow that athlete to achieve a really fast top speed. If we look at leg stiffness, we've been talking a lot about leg stiffness, the affected leg leg stiffness actually gets lower across speed and the unaffected leg stays about the same or increases a little bit. So there are many factors, biomechanical factors, that seem to suggest that running specific prostheses impair force produ production and that limits top speed. So this is for straight ahead running, but in a track and field event, there are many aspects of the race. So there's also starting blocks. Okay. Oops. So we did a study looking at starting block performance in athletes with a unilateral transtibial amputation. And we did something clever with the data to try to understand how prostheses affect starts. We had athletes start in their usual configuration. Let's say their unaffected leg was in the front block. We had them also start with their unaffected leg in the back block. Okay. We took the data from the unaffected leg in the front block and the unaffected leg in the back block, and we made a virtual non-amputee. We did the same thing with the affected legs and tried to understand how an athlete with bilateral amputations would achieve a start compared to a non-amputee. 
Not surprisingly, they were 23% slower. So their acceleration out of the blocks is 23% slower just from using those running specific prostheses. In another track and field event, uh, you can think of the curve as another really important event, especially in the 200 and 400 meter sprint. And athletes with a unilateral amputation don't necessarily have a choice of whether their left or right leg is amputated. So, and track and field events are always run counterclockwise. So we wanted to know whether having a left or right leg amputation or having your, your affected leg on the inside or the outside of the curve affected curve running speed. So we compared curve running in two different directions. We had athletes run counterclockwise and clockwise. We had about half of the athletes with a right leg amputation and half with a left leg amputation. And we found that the prosthesis limits curve running speed. So athletes were 3.9% faster with their affected leg on the outside compared to the inside of the curve. Okay, so all these things so far, to me, suggest that prostheses aren't effective for running and sprinting. But maybe it's just that athletes haven't figured out which prosthesis to choose. So we did kind of a huge study where we looked at whether there was an optimal prosthetic model, stiffness, and height for running and sprinting. I'm just going to show you sprinting. So what we did is we had three different prosthetic models, three brands, Oser, Autobach, Freedom Innovations. We went uh, the recommended stiffness category and height, one category more stiff, one category less stiff. The best of those three, we went up two centimeters and down two centimeters. So each athlete ran in 15 different configurations from a slow speed to their fastest top speed. So when I said it's a huge project, it's a huge project. Anyways, <laughs> so they were in the lab um, probably about five days because they were maximum sprint trials, so it took a lot out of these athletes. So in adjusting all of these things, we found that in athletes with bilateral amputations, top speed was enhanced when they used a J-shaped compared to a C-shaped prosthesis by about 8 to 8.3%. We didn't find that there was any relationship between stiffness or height, which for athletes with bilateral amputations has also generated some controversy. We found that these top speeds were associated with increased peak vertical ground reaction forces, increased leg stiffness, I mean vertical stiffness, sorry, decreased contact time, increased step frequency, and increased step length. So many of the same variables that are associated with top speed for non-amputees. In our athletes with a unilateral transtibial amputation, we also found that the J-shaped prosthesis outperformed the C-shaped prosthesis. It enhanced top, top speed by anywhere from 0.4 to 0.8 meters per second. Again, no significant effect of stiffness and height. These top speeds were associated with increased stance average vertical ground reaction forces, increased vertical stiffness, decreased contact times, and symmetric stance average vertical ground reaction forces. To give you an idea of what the fastest athlete is doing, I've got another video to share. This might be my favorite video to share. Um, this is our fastest athlete at his fastest top speed. And it's about pretty close to 12 meters per second. <laughs> and I apologize for having to go in and out of PowerPoint, but if I played it here, it uh, makes it look even faster, which is hard to believe, so <laughs> I want to make sure you believe it. In any case, we were really interested not only in how all those athletes performed across speeds, but in particular how the fastest sprinter ever measured on a treadmill with a unilateral amputation, how he performs across speed and what kind of biomechanics he utilizes to get to those fast top speeds. So first I'm going to show you kinematics. So we have step length on the y-axis here, and running speed is way down on the bottom there on the, on the x-axis. The affected leg is the open diamond, and the unaffected leg is the closed diamond. And so what you can see is a cross speed. Step length is pretty consistent between the legs, but if anything, the affected leg has a little bit longer step length than the unaffected leg. Okay, if we look at step time, 
So one over the contact time and the aerial time. You can see, sort of, I'm sorry, one over the contact time and the swing time. You can see that the affected leg has just a slightly longer step time than the unaffected leg across speeds. If we continue this and look at contact time and aerial time, you can see that both decrease across speeds, both legs decrease across speeds, but there's just a little difference between the affected compared to the unaffected leg. In general, if we kind of summarize all these results and we compare uh, Richard to other non-amputees, we find that the kinematics of the affected leg are much uh, more similar to non-amputees compared to the unaffected leg, which is actually quite similar to bilateral amputees. So that's the kinematics. But I told you earlier, actually, it's kinetics, I think, that really determine top speed. So we'll look at the kinetics. Look at the changes in vertical ground reaction force across speed. So on the left side, I'm going to have the affected leg. And on the right side, I'm going to have the unaffected leg. And again, we've got vertical ground reaction force in units of body weight on the y-axis, time on the x. At slow speeds, you can see that there's sort of a force discrepancy between the two legs and a slightly longer contact time in the affected compared to unaffected leg. But as he gets faster and faster, contact time seems to be about the same. But you can see that there's a huge difference between those peak vertical ground reaction forces between the affected and unaffected leg. At the fastest top speed of 11.55 meters per second, which is what you just saw, there's a 21% difference between those two peak forces. So again, it's quite likely that prostheses limit top speed and limit performance. In this example, the kinetics of the affected leg using the prosthesis are very similar to athletes with bilateral amputations. And the unaffected is very similar to non-amputees. So that's for running and sprinting, but let's talk a little bit more now about jumping. So Marcus Riem is an athlete from Germany that has a unilateral transtibial amputation, and he's created a little bit of controversy lately because his jump distance, his personal record, is 8.4 meters. To put that in context, in the Rio Olympics just recently, the gold medal in the Olympics was won by Jeff Henderson with a jump of 8.38 meters. So you can do the math, right? If, if Marcus had been allowed to compete, he could have won the gold medal in the Olympics. How cool would that be? But we wanted to understand the use of a prosthesis for a long jump. Right now, all Paralympic athletes with a unilateral amputation tend to be jumping off of their running specific prosthesis, their affected leg. I think because Marcus does that, but we'll see. So we put together uh, an international group of researchers from the German Sport University in Cologne, myself from CU Boulder, and also from Tokyo, Japan, the National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology. We brought Marcus into an indoor track facility that had force plates and instrumentation so we could measure how he moved. We also had two other athletes with a unilateral amputation that were extremely competitive in Paralympic sport. And then we matched that with seven non-amputees that had very similar jump distances to our athletes with amputations. We had them complete a couple different trials. We had them do straight ahead sprint trials as fast as they could get and we measured their forces during top speed. We also had them jump, and we had them do a maximum distance long jump, and we could measure the force they exerted on the ground during that takeoff step. So you may or may not be very into long jump, but it's, it's sort of simple biomechanically. You want to run very fast in your approach. You want to convert as much of that horizontal velocity into horizontal and vertical velocity during that takeoff step. So it's really important to run fast and use good technique in the takeoff. So we measured those things in athletes with transtibial amputations. And their jumps in the lab, on average, were 7.25 meters. And our non-amputees were 7.27 meters, so a pretty close match of groups. And Marcus's value, just to give you context, was 7.96 meters, which is a pretty impressive jump. Okay. So let's look at the top speed trials first. 
Okay, so these are top speed, just like I've shown you in a lot of other different um, uh, images up here. If we look at the forces exerted by each leg in body weights on the y-axis and time on the x, for non-amputees, their curve is blue. For amputees, their unaffected leg is green and their affected leg is red. And the dashed black line is just a spring mass model to try to get a sense for that. So for any given step during a top speed trial, in these athletes, similar to every other athlete that I've shown you up here, there's a huge difference in the peak force, 24%. And it's likely that that influences top speed, which for athletes with an amputation was about 9.4 meters per second. Non-amputees was about 10.2 meters per second. To give you context, Marcus, though an impressive top speed of 9.98, was below the average for non-amputees. So that's for top speed. We can use top speed. We're going to keep that top speed. And now I'm going to compare this to the run-up speed or the approach. So in the approach for those maximum distance jumps, there was also a big speed discrepancy between athletes with an amputation, about 8.7 meters per second, and non-amputees around 9.4 meters per second. Marcus, again, was fast, but just below the average for non-amputees. So this suggests that the prosthesis, just like I've told you, impairs force, it impairs top speed, it also seems to impair approach speed. So then we also wanted to look at that takeoff step. So if we look here, this is for non-amputees, their takeoff step, force in units of body weight, Okay, for vertical ground reaction forces and horizontal ground reaction forces. And each of those curves is color-coded with the jump distance that they attain. So for example, the blue is 7.9 meters. That's the best jump of the group. And you can see his peak forces were kind of unreal, right? Like 12 times his body weight in the vertical direction and like around 7 in the horizontal direction. But you can also appreciate that as you go through those colors, they don't always correspond with the longest distance jumped. If we compare our non-amputees to athletes with a transtibial amputation, you can see that the force profile looks very different. Okay? So Marcus's values were like around six times body weight compared to 12, so almost half as much. So very different force profiles in that takeoff step, and we wanted to see how that affected then um, the way or the efficiency of that movement. So here I've got horizontal velocity on the top graph, vertical velocity on the bottom graph. The first images are touchdown, and then the second are toe off. Okay. So athletes without amputations, non-amputees, start at about 9.3 meters per second, and then their horizontal velocity is reduced by about 1.1 meter per second during that takeoff step. At the same time, they're generating force on the ground to increase their vertical velocity to about 3.4 meters per second. Okay, so they lose some horizontal speed. They gain some vertical speed. Let's compare that to our amputees. So athletes with an amputation are much slower to start with. During, uh, they approach the board much slower, around 8.3 meters per second. But their, their speed reduction in the horizontal direction is only about 0.6 meters per second. At the same time, they increase vertical velocity by about the same amount. And I showed you on the very beginning slide that all these resulted in the same average jump distances. But the really impressive thing to me is that athletes with amputation lose less horizontal speed. That seems to enhance jump performance. It's the first time I've said, huh a prosthesis or a spring could enhance the takeoff step, which is really cool. Marcus wanted to compete in the Rio Olympics, and we presented all of this data to the IAAF. And uh, it's important to note, though, that in 2015, the IAAF changed their rules. They put the burden of proof on the athlete so athletes have to prove their prosthesis does not give them a competitive advantage. Let me say that again. Athletes must prove that their prosthesis does not give them a competitive advantage. It's a little bit confusing to me to try to figure out how we could 
potentially prove advantage or disadvantage. So we tried to go along with this rule we presented uh, to the IAAF and we said at this stage of the research we cannot state that Marcus Reams' prosthesis does or does not provide him with an overall advantage. I don't usually like to be that confusing when I say things, but um, that was really confusing. But, but it's like basically what we're trying to say is it seems like these two things balance them, themselves out, right? They have a, a slower approach but a more effective takeoff. So it's potentially equal. But the IAAF didn't like that, they didn't take that, and they didn't allow Marcus to compete. So we'll continue working on this. I'll continue working on this and, and trying to do more research to try to understand how prostheses affect performance. So in general, I've shown you a lot of stuff about whether prostheses could augment or impair performance. And it seems that prostheses can restore metabolic costs, but not biomechanics for running, sprinting, and jumping. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'd like to thank my lab, thank my collaborators, thank the athletes that have come into my lab. And I want to give, kind of put this up here for you to start to think about whether we should allow prostheses in sport, especially in this upcoming Olympic Games in Tokyo in 2020. Thank you.